Hi, everybody. This is Jennifer Phillips Russo, the Viticulture Extension Specialist with the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program. And I'm here today with Kevin Martin, our Business Management Specialist, for our weekly podcast. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about all the labor issues we've been hearing from the advisory committee and growers out on our farm visits or my farm visits. And we have maybe some ideas about some capital investment projects that might ease that a little bit. So Kevin, take it away. Yes. So I think uh, about six weeks ago, we did a quick update on the minimum wage in New York State, which has been changing every year for quite a long time. Um, that This was the last phase schedule increase in minimum wage. It was not the last annual increase. It was just the last one that was announced. So going forward, we don't know where New York State minimum wage is going to go. We just know that um, New York State has regulatory authority to continue increasing that minimum wage annually. Whether they base that on consumer price index or um, median, uh, median in income, we really don't know what factors they're going to use as far as I've seen. But what we have seen in addition to that increasing minimum wage is just in general, upward uh, pressure on the cost of labor. Uh, part of that is related to that increase in minimum wage. That's probably the least significant factor right now. So what we're seeing in, on the New York side are the increasing costs of benefits, whether it's paid family leave, unemployment insurance, uh, paid sick time, all of these things are required. Uh, workman's comp, um, uh, paid time off for COVID sickness, which is different than paid sick leave. Um, I'm probably gonna forget something, but there's a lot of benefits that are adding up to additional costs for labor. Uh, you go over to the Pennsylvania side and it looks like overtime, I missed overtime in New York. That might be one of the most expensive during harvest. It doesn't seem to be a huge factor in pruning. But you go over to the Pennsylvania side and it looks a lot like what it did in New York five years ago where um, you're, you're responsible for FICA, and if you're a larger farm, you're probably responsible for unemployment insurance. Smaller farms probably are not. Workman's comp is kind of a wild west. Everybody should have it, but not everybody does. In any event, it's not terribly expensive anyway. And after that, there's really nothing. Um, initially, increases in New York State minimum wage, uh, studies by the Federal Reserve indicated that that did not increase the cost of labor in Pennsylvania and neighboring counties. They specifically studied border counties. Um, now they are seeing that it does just depend on what industry you're in. Agriculture is small enough so that it hasn't been studied. But anecdotally, I would say that there are a number of factors affecting rising prices in Pennsylvania and um, probably New York State minimum wage has been one of them. That being said, labor now is definitely cheaper in Pennsylvania. So what do we do about it? I and mean, then we're just gonna keep rising. Yeah, so the one thing growers focus on is pruning and that's partially a good thing. I mean, pruning is a significant portion of the labor cost. We can offset some of that with mechanization. I think a lot of growers know that. Right. Um, I would pay particular attention to the pruner. So more aggressive pruning pre-pruning machines that remove um, unwanted wood, remove, uh, you know, rachises, things that may harbor disease like black rot specifically, well, I mean, um, that's going to decrease the cost of hand follow-up because you can't eliminate the cost of hand follow-up. And honestly, one of the biggest challenges is finding affordable and practical hand follow-up labor. So if you're paying 32 cents a vine for hand follow-up, I mean, maybe you're getting a slightly better job, maybe you're not, but you're, you're not necessarily walking into this offsetting labor costs the way you wanted to. And that's a particular problem that becomes more problematic when labor is in short supply because then pruners get to not only dictate what they get paid, but they also get to have a greater say in how they work. Um, so, that, that, that is a concern that I would say mechanization doesn't work as well when labor is in short supply in that particular area because you're not eliminating the labor, you're trying to change the behavior of labor, which is challenging. So to the extent that you can 
uh, increase the mechanization of that activity, you, you do have a chance of some success. Um, what else could they do? So on, I mean, on the pruning side, there's not a whole lot you can do. Um, at least there's not a whole lot that's been commercially adopted. Um, changing your pruning style, I think offers a significant amount of saver, savings and labor. You go from longer spurs, technically Concord is spur pruned, even though we think of it as canes because they're so long, we think of them as canes. Uh, if you shorten those spurs up, you dramatically reduce the cost of hand follow-up, but you, um, you know, you completely change the dynamics of your practice, your practices and fruitfulness and yield exactly. and tonnage. And that's why that hasn't been commercially adopted. I think it's too complicated to really figure out what is going to be best for most growers. Um, and it may not make sense yet, but we could get there. We could. Um, so what I think, especially on the New York side, but I think we're getting there in Pennsylvania, we really do, do need to start um, a renewed focus on what your labor costs are during the year, not during the dormant season. Uh, so sure. to the extent, yeah, go ahead. I was just sitting here as you're talking, as you, and my brain was moving around about, we just had the CFAP rounds. Um, people, some of people, if they had crop insurance for the frost events, then we had the declaration of the disaster. So there's probably some money out there. I'm not business management portion. So that's why my brain is thinking and I'm asking you, could possibly some of that money out there be used to invest into some of these capital? Yeah, gains? I think looking specifically at some of the government money, it's been all over the place in terms of how much people received, but it certainly didn't hurt anybody. Um, and prices are up. So honestly, you know, the 35, 36 cents a vine of hand pruning, the extra $3 an hour of full-time labor costs, um, that could all be offset by these higher prices. So right now we're mostly in a position to try to become sustainable going forward. We can afford these increases in labor costs right now. It psychologically, I think it's it's difficult for growers, but if you just do the math and you say, you know, an extra $30 a ton times five ton to the acre, even, you know, you're looking at an extra $150 an acre. Um, our labor costs have not increased that much in the last five, six years at all. Not even close. Not to be Debbie Downer, but the market actually fluctuates up and down and up and down. So right. Yeah. So I think what we're talking about here is not how do we make money this year? Because this labor thing is so terrible. We're, we're talking about how do we make sure we get the work done we need to get done? And how do we, when prices fall again, make sure we're in a position to, if, if not succeed, not fail. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's what we're trying to do. And I think the focus right now um, is probably best for a lot of growers to reduce especially our large growers, because we've seen a lot of consolidation. Um, I think our, our, best, our best thing to do is focus on that paid labor, uh, which is in the growing season. Capital investments um, that we've already discussed, most of them are similar to what some growers have already done, but we have large growers that still use single row sprayers. We have medium-sized growers where it didn't make sense for them to move to multi-row sprayers. And I think that calculation should begin to evolve. I, I think if you bought a single row sprayer last year, it probably doesn't make sense to throw it away and buy a new one this year that's multi-row. But um, I think it does make sense to revisit those investments as you think about making them. And perfect mm -hmm. segue to say, that's what Kevin Martin is here for. So if you guys have any questions or you're thinking about doing that, please reach out to him. He'd be glad to sit down and talk to you through it. Yeah, and I think that's an important first step. I think it is a little complicated to try to, you know, throw out some advice in a podcast that's not specific to an individual farm. Right. Um, you know, for some growers, I think a fertilizer spreader is probably their best investment. It, but it depends a lot on what you're doing on your farm. If if you're about to make a concerted effort into soil health that's going to take three applications a year and you're using a Vicon, you can save a lot of paid labor if you're paying someone to run that Vicon. 
if you move to a fertilizer spreader that's probably going to be in the range of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars if you buy it brand new. Um, that's a lot more expensive than a Vicon, but as far as a piece of capital that allows you to cover multiple rows and run faster, um, it's not very expensive. And now for other growers, you know, if you're if you're counting trips through your vineyard, it might be it typically if you're not working specifically on a, on an issue like soil health, just in average over the next 20 years, it's probably going to be your fungicide sprayer, which is why we saw most people move in that direction with multi-row equipment with a fungicide sprayer. Um, in New York, not as much in Pennsylvania, uh, but in New York, the calculation has definitely changed for bulk harvesting because that overtime piece and the um, paid sick time really incentivizes you to use less labor at harvest where it becomes very difficult to avoid overtime. Mm -hmm. And this can be true even of smaller farms. So, so yes, you, you harvest 50 acres of grapes and that's all you harvest with your old Chisholm rider. You probably still don't necessarily want to go full on bulk, but you can start adopting parts of the bulk production. And um, at 50 acres, you might be a little too small, but anything above that, because even at 50 acres, you're probably going to accidentally have to pay overtime at some point in the future because we're not talking about 41 hours a week. We're not necessarily even talking about 60 hours a week. We're talking about that seventh day of rest, where if you don't give them a dedicated day of rest, you have to pay overtime for that day. And what we saw certainly in larger operations that were harvesting was they were paying more overtime for day of rest than they were for over 60 hours. So yeah, they got a bunch of guys that are crazy, work really hard. They work 65 hours a week. So they pay five hours of overtime. Well, then they've got guys that are understandably, you know, 60, 70 years old trying to keep up at harvest and they want to work four hours a day, seven days a week. And you end up paying the guy who works 28 hours in a week, you end up paying him as much overtime as the guy that works 64. And, um, you know, not to take a shot at anybody working hard or not working hard, but just looking at what those payrolls look like, they paid more overtime for people working less than 60 hours than they did for people working more. So to the extent that you can reduce that labor force, because that's the big problem. You, ha you have one full-time guy that you need all year, maybe, or maybe you have less than that. And then all of a sudden at harvest, you need three, four, five full-time guys or, or full-time guys plus overtime. If you can reduce the number of people you need, you can start working them in shifts and avoiding overtime. Oh, that's a lot to think about. I'm glad we have you here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's not going to be, you know, a thing that every grower needs to do. And I think that's why, like what you said, just reach out, give us a call, give me a call, maybe not Jen. No, don't call me on that one. <laughs> well, she's going to do is tell you to call me, so you don't need to call um, but, um, yeah, you know, it's specific to individual operations. So there are almost every production practice at this point can be made more efficient by spending money on capital. It's just a question of whether or not that makes sense. Okay. Well, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, either list them below or please feel free to reach out to us via our cell phone, our email. We are available. I know it's a different than what you're used to because nobody can actually come into our offices, but we are available via phone, email, reach out. We'll come out and see you if it's safe and socially acceptable for COVID. And if not, we'll handle it over the phone, Zoom, walk you through it. We're here for you. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you next week here as well. Bye now.